Hello and welcome to Ministry to Muslims 20th Annual Strong Tower Conference. Thank you all for joining us tonight. I don't know about you guys, but I'm excited. We have some amazing speakers this weekend. I love that we get this opportunity to come together and learn and get educated on all types of topics, which brings me to tonight's workshop, Evidence for the Crucifixion. Tonight's speaker currently serves as professor of Islamic uh, apologetics at Toronto Baptist Seminary. He graduated from the University of Toronto with a Bachelor of Arts in Religious Studies in 1999, as well as a master's degree in Biblical Studies in 2003. After this, he completed his PhD studies at Radboud University in the Netherlands in 2012. He is both gifted and skilled in the area of Christian apologetics. Get your pen and notebook ready and help me welcome our guest speaker tonight, Dr. Tony Costa. I'm delighted to be joining you uh, here from Canada. I'm also at a, at a conference here uh, and uh, I've been going in between conferences online, but I'm physically here right now at a conference in, uh, in Peterborough, Ontario, Canada. So uh, today I'm going to be talking about the case for the uh, crucifixion and we're going to be doing a little bit of history going into the first century and before. And what I want to do is I want to discuss with you the uh, reality, not only of crucifixion, but I want you to notice that the accounts that we are given from other first century sources um, agree with what we find in the New Testament, particularly the Gospels, where they talk about the crucifixion of Jesus. And so the first thing we want to be aware of is we want to be aware uh, of the fact that I'm just going to be sharing a screen here uh, with you folks. We want to be aware of the fact that the practice of crucifixion was practiced by the Romans. And the Romans got the idea of crucifixion from the Persians. So the Romans were not the first to come up with this uh, practice. It was already done by the Persians and the Romans, if you will, perfected it. So what I wanna do is we're gonna look at some ancient writers who spoke about this practice and you will notice that a lot of what they have to say agrees with what we read about in the New Testament gospels. In my second part, I'm going to be uh, talking about the crucifixion and Islam. But we want to talk about, first of all, the evidence for crucifixion. So a number of writers who have addressed the subject of crucifixion, we have Josephus. And Josephus was a first century Jewish writer, a contemporary of um, the Apostle Paul. And in his book, The Wars of the Jews, he points out about a person that was going out to be crucified. He talked about the scourging that this person received. And he, and he says here, he was whipped until his bones showed. So what this shows us is that the, the scourging that victims of crucifixion would sustain was of such a measure that it was brutally violent to the point that the whips would uh, basically remove the skin and flesh from the body of the victim until the bones were visible. So this confirms what we know about the Roman practice of scourging and that it was a brutal uh, practice indeed. Another writer is a Greek writer by the name of Plutarch. And uh, Plutarch lived from about uh, AD 46 to 120. And Plutarch says this, each criminal who goes to execution must carry his own cross on his back. So notice that what Plutarch says here about crucifixion, about victims of crucifixion, is that they were given the charge to carry the cross on their own back. And what do we read about in the Gospels? Jesus carried the cross as well. Now, I want you to realize that when we talk about the carrying of the cross, most pictures of Jesus carrying the cross show him carrying the, the T-shaped cross. But that's not how the Romans did things. What they did, as we shall see, is the victim would have his arms tied to the horizontal 
beam of the cross, and he would carry that horizontal beam on his back to the place of execution. And at the place of execution, you had the vertical beam, uh, which was known as the stipe. Uh, and, and what they would do is the person would get to that location, and then they would put them down and nail their hands to the cross beam, the, the, the horizontal beam, and then they would raise the victim onto the vertical beam and then nail their feet uh, onto uh, the footrest. And so what we're told here, again, coincides with what we read about in the New Testament. Now, there's another um, Greek writer uh, by the name of Keratin, uh, who lived about 25 BC to AD 50. And so he would have lived through the time period of Jesus and the, the first century church. And this is what he says. He's talking about 60 men who were uh, charged and convicted and uh, sentenced to death by crucifixion. He says this, 60 men were paraded out, chained together by the foot and neck, each carrying his own cross. The executioners added this grim public spectacle to the punishment as an extra deterrent to anyone thinking about committing the same crime. And so notice here that Keratin points out that these uh, 16 prisoners were taken out and they were chained together, but notice they were carrying their own cross, which would be the cross, uh, the horizontal cross beam on their back. And notice that the, the, the Romans, the executioners, the reason why they did this was as a deterrent against those who dared to oppose the authority of Rome. And then we have the Roman writer Seneca at the very bottom there, born in around 4 BC. He's born around the same time Jesus was born. The, the birth of Jesus is usually placed at 4 BC, and he died in 65 AD. This is what Seneca says. Some hang their victims upside down, that is the Romans. Some impale them through the private parts. Others stretch out their arms onto forked poles. So this gives you an idea of the brutality of the Roman soldiers. And notice that some of the victims would be hung upside down. Others would be impaled through their private parts. I don't want to get uh, too detailed here, but the idea is that the, the impalement would be uh, placed through the rectal region and then pierced through the body. So a very gruesome very ghoulish way of killing people. And notice they also stretched out their arms onto forked poles. And so this would be a case of crucifixion where uh, in some cases the cross would be a neck shape and the person would have their arms outstretched onto this X-shaped cross. And uh, according to church tradition, uh, Andrew, the brother of Peter, uh, died uh, in, in that type of a cross. That's why St. Andrew's cross is an X shape. Now, other important writers, this is Seneca again, but we really want to pay attention to what Seneca says here. He says here, is there such a thing as a person who would actually prefer wasting away in pain on a cross, dying limb by limb, one drop of blood at a time, rather than dying quickly? Would any human being willingly choose to be fastened to that cursed tree, especially after the beating that left them deathly weak, deformed, swelling with vicious welts on shoulders and chest, and struggling to draw every last agonizing breath? Anyone facing such a death would plead to die rather than mount the cross. So notice here that Seneca is talking about the gruesome, excruciating pain that crucified victims would endure. Now, even the word excruciating, if you look at the, the word we use, excruciating, like I have an excruciating toothache, for example, the word excruciating is, is a Latin word. It's made up of two Latin words, ex, which means out of, and cruce, which is cross. So excruciating literally means out of the cross. So the pain is out of the cross. That is to say, a very intense pain. So Seneca here basically says that suicide would be preferable to crucifixion. And that's why he talks about this person, person on the cross 
wasting away on pain, uh, in pain. Notice he talks about their limbs, their, their, the, the blood, they're dying one drop at a time. And then he says, wouldn't dying quickly be preferable to this? Now, I want you to remember Seneca's reference here to the limbs, the, the idea of the limbs of the person uh, being, uh, if you will, hanging on a cross and being stretched and so forth. And, and notice how he talks about the cross as that cursed tree. Remember that, because in the New Testament, it also talks about Jesus bore our sins in his body on the tree, 1 Peter 2, 24. And whoever hangs on a tree, according to Deuteronomy 21, verse 23, is cursed by God. But notice what Seneca also says here. He says that the person that was fastened to the tree, they, they were fastened to the tree after the beating that left them deathly weak. What is that beating? It's the flogging. Some of them, most victims of crucifixion, would endure a serious flogging. And notice how he says it left them deathly weak, deformed, swelling with vicious welts on shoulders and chest, and they're struggling to draw every last uh, agonizing breath. Now, remember, when Jesus carried the crossbeam, you will notice that in Matthew, Mark, and Luke, at some point, the Romans made Simon of Cyrene carry the crossbeam. Uh, you need to ask yourself, why did Jesus, why is it Jesus was no longer able to carry his cross all the way? Well, the only thing that we could surmise is that he would have received a brutal beating. Remember, the, the guards, the Roman guards uh, uh, mocked him, they spit on him, they punched him, they played a game of of hot hand where they would punch him and then say, who hit you? And, and if he didn't answer, they'd hit him again. And then they would give him this brutal scourging. And so you can imagine by the time Jesus is carrying this cross beam after this brutal beating, he is already weakened. And that is why he's he's not able to carry it. And so Simon of Cyrene is, is, is ordered by the Romans to carry the, the beam, the cross beam for Jesus. But notice the reference to the person is struggling to draw every last agonizing breath. We're going to come back to that. And uh, it's interesting how in Seneca's last uh, statement there, he actually says anyone facing such a death would plead to die rather than mount the cross. In other words, suicide is preferable to crucifixion. That's how bad it was. And this was uh, spoken, of course, by a Roman uh, uh, writer. Now, we look at another Roman writer by the name of Cicero, and notice Cicero also speaks about this practice of crucifixion. Notice he says, reliable witnesses saw the man, that is the victim, the, the one who sentenced to be crucified, saw the man being dragged to the cross while crying out that he was a Roman citizen and knew he's talking to this guy by the name of Varus. He's writing a letter to him. And you, Varus, confirmed that he did cry out that he was a Roman citizen, yet you sent him to a most cruel and shameful death anyhow. So what Cicero is talking about here is he is saying here that there was a man that was a Roman citizen, and they were dragging him out to be crucified, and he was crying out, I'm a Roman citizen. Now, now why is this important? Crucifixion was only reserved for the worst of criminals. It was reserved for uh, uh, insurrectionists. It was re reserved for slaves who uh, rebelled against their masters or rebelled against the government. Uh, it was made for robbers and uh, uh, just basically marginalized people. But the one person that was exempt from crucifixion was a Roman citizen. And so one of the rights you had as a Roman citizen was you could choose to be executed by beheading, which was fast and uh, uh, mostly merciful in, in, in comparison to crucifixion. Do you know anybody in the New Testament who also was an apostle but was also a Roman citizen by birth? Well, yeah, that was the Apostle Paul. Remember, Paul was a Roman citizen, and that's why in the book of Acts, if you remember, Paul pleads 
uh, he appeals to Caesar and he is sent off to Rome to stand trial uh, in Rome. And that's where Paul ends up in Acts 28. He's in, under house arrest in Rome awaiting his trial. But because he was a Roman citizen, according to uh, church tradition, Paul was, was executed by beheading. So Paul was beheaded. Now, in the case of Peter, according to church tradition, Peter was crucified upside down. Now, of course, Peter was crucified because he was not a Roman citizen. There are some exceptions where Roman citizens were crucified, but that was for very, very treasonous crimes, like trying to kill the emperor, for example. But notice what Cicero says here. Cicero is pointing out here that a Roman citizen is not supposed to be crucified. It's against the law to crucify a Roman citizen. And so he mentions that here in this quote, and uh, he chides his friend Verus for doing nothing about it. But notice how Cicero refers to crucifixion here as a cruel and shameful death. Now, notice that this agrees with what we read about in the New Testament. Remember, Paul said that the preaching of the cross is a stumbling block to Jews. It is foolishness, but it is also a stumbling block to Jews. Now, why would the crucifixion of Jesus be a stumbling block to the Jews? It's a stumbling block because they couldn't conceive that their messianic king, how could the Messiah, the anointed one of God, the king of Israel, how could the Messiah die the death of a common criminal? And not just the death of a common criminal, but the most shameful and cruel types of death, which is crucifixion. And so this is why Paul says that the crucified Christ, the message of the crucified Christ, is a stumbling block to the Jews because they just can't get their heads around the fact that the Messiah would die such a cruel and violent death. So notice that so far we have found that there's nothing that we've read from these ancient writers that says anything contrary to what we read about in the New Testament. And then we have the Jewish historian, again, Josephus. Um, and Josephus also recounts for us in his book, The Wars of the Jews, he says this, and I quote, he's referring here to AD 70, when the temple in Jerusalem was uh, destroyed by the Romans. Notice what he says here. Every day, Roman soldiers caught 500 Jews or more. The soldiers, driven by their hatred of the Jews, nailed them to crosses. They nailed them in many different positions to entertain themselves and to horrify the Jews watching this spectacle from inside the walled city of Jerusalem. In time, the soldiers ran out of wood for crosses and room for crosses, even if they had found more wood. So notice the brutality here. 500 Jewish men are taken, and the soldiers, driven by hatred, nailed them to 500 crosses. And notice how they nailed them in different positions to mock them and to entertain them, and as a means to horrify those who watched. And notice that this bloodbath was so severe that the soldiers ran, ran out of wood for crosses. That's how severe it was. So in the first century, you, you need to realize Jesus was not the only person who was crucified. There were hundreds and, and even thousands of Jews and others who were crucified by the Romans. And so it was not unusual to go by the, uh, the walls of Jerusalem, outside the walls of Jerusalem. It was not unusual to see crosses along the road with people hanging on them. And the Romans deliberately di did that uh, to instill fear on those who would mess with Rome. In other words, this is what's going to happen to you if you mess with Rome. Now, let's get into some details about the methods that the Romans uh, uh, used in crucifixion. If you notice here to the left, you will notice there's a typical Roman uh, whip, sometimes called the cat of nine tails. The Roman whip was made up of a wooden handle with uh, leather tongs. 
And on these leather thongs, you would have, they would attach these metal balls to it and small pieces of bone and sharp pieces of bone would be attached to it. This was known as the flagrum. The victim, as you see in the middle, the victim would be disrobed or uh, the stripped of their clothes. They would be uh, stark naked. They would uh, tie their hands to the post and the Roman legionnaire would take the flagrum, as you see on the left there, and strike it on the back of the victim. But you'll notice because the flagrum or the whip has these small pieces of bone and metal balls, what it does is it creates bruises on the body and the bones, the pieces of bone, lacerate the skin. And so as you can see the victim there, his back is completely stripped or lacerated. His back would have been fully bruised from the, uh, the metal balls that are on the flagrum. And on the far right corner, you will see the, the direction of the whip. It would be towards the center of the spine. And in some cases, and notice the, the buttocks would also be exposed. So the buttocks would also be lacerated, as well as the legs. So if you look at the legs of the victim, the legs would also be lacerated. Now, in the Jewish whipping, uh, according to the Law of Moses, a person who is, is punished and is to receive a scourge, the, the Jewish law says that it's 40 stripes minus one, which means the reason why it's 40 stripes minus one is just in case the person miscounted. It was to maintain justice. But the difference with the Roman whip is that there was no limit. The Romans could just keep whipping you. In some cases, Josephus tells us, the victim died at the post from hypovolemic shock, excessive bleeding. And in some cases, we're told, Josephus again tells us, not only would the bones be laid bare, but you could see the person's intestines as well. So remember what we're told in the Gospels, that they scourged Jesus. And remember what Isaiah says, that by his stripes we are healed. And also remember Isaiah said in Isaiah 52, that his appearance, the, the appearance of the Messiah, was so marred beyond human comprehension that men turned their faces away from him. In other words, he was so beaten up to a pulp that people would turn their faces because that is how badly beaten he was. And remember, this whip as well would strike the face at times, and so that would, that would place lacerations on the face of the victim as well. Now, remember I told you uh, earlier that the person who was condemned to be crucified would carry the horizontal beam on their back. And, and notice that the Latin word for that is the patibulum, the patibulum. Notice the victim has his arms tied to the horizontal beam and the victim is forced to carry. Now, rem now remember, after being severely scourged and whipped, the victim is now has this wooden horizontal beam placed on their back. You can imagine the pain as that, that wood is being rubbed against the back after it's been lacerated. The victim carries the patibulum on his back and he carries it to the place of execution. The New Testament calls it Golgotha, the place of the skull, or as we call it in, in Latin, uh, Calvary. It's coming to English as Calvary. And you'll notice the, the stipes there. If you look to the left of that victim carrying the, the horizontal beam, you'll notice the stipe. The stipes is the vertical beam, the vertical beam of the cross, which was at the place of execution. So Jesus did not carry a T-shaped cross, as we see in many pictures. That is not how it happened. So be very careful. Pictures are, are very misleading. And uh, a lot of them are just not, not based uh, according to fact. Okay, so 
the victim then is 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 taken through the streets uh, of Jerusalem as a spectacle, and the victim would have clothing put on them after the scourge. They would put some clothing on them, so the victim would have clothing at this point. But then when they came to the place of execution, they would strip the victim naked again. In other words, crucified people were hung naked. Now, when we see depictions of the crucifixion of Jesus, you will notice many of those depictions show Jesus with a loincloth covering his thighs, his waist area. But in reality, the Romans hung crucified victims naked on the cross. And that was to insult them, to embarrass them. Basically, it was to heap insult upon them. And so Jesus was hung on a cross, stark naked before the world. And that was done to, again, heap insult upon him. So notice the cross there in the middle. The cross there uh, may have been a T-shaped, uh, like a capital T, a T-shaped uh, cross. Or it could have had, as you see on the bottom right corner, <coughs> excuse me, on the bottom right corner, uh, the vertical beam may have extended a little higher uh, from the, the horizontal cross beam. So the victim would be taken to the place of execution. They would be stripped. And that's what we read in the Gospel of John, chapter 19, that they took his rope and they cast, they cast lots for his rope. They didn't want to tear it because it was a seamless rope. And it, it was like a trophy. It was like a, a, a piece of paraphernalia. It was like a souvenir, if you will, that they wanted to keep because of the fame of Jesus in Jerusalem. And so they would have uh, removed his clothing. They would have placed him on his back, and they would have, uh, they would have driven uh, sharp spikes through his wrists onto the horizontal beam. The horizontal beam would then be elevated and placed on the vertical beam, the stipes there. And there's the measurements for you. Uh, a standard cross would be lengthwise about five to six feet. Or if you follow the metric system, one and a half to 1.8 meters. And the height of the cross would have been about six to eight feet. Now notice that near the bottom of the cross, you had have something called the sedil. The sedil is a footrest. This is where the feet of the crucified, they would either be, um, the, the one foot would be placed over the other, <coughs> or quite possibly uh, they could have had nails driven through both feet on, on the side. The other thing that they would also have is they would have a charge that would be placed above their head called the titleus, and that's what you see on the right there, the titleus. And on the titleus, you would have the name of the, the, of the uh, convicted criminal and the charge. So if you look at the right top uh, reading, that is Hebrew. And um, what it says there, uh, if you look at the top there, it's read from right to left. It says Yeshua HaNetzer Melech Ha. Hayyadim, that is Jesus of Nazareth, the King of the Jews. In the second uh, inscription, you have the Latin Jesus Nazarenos Rex Iuaderum, Jesus of Nazareth, the King of the Jews, and then you would have it in Greek at the bottom, Jesus Ho Nazareos Ho Basilios Ton Iuadeon. Now, where do we get this from? This this comes from the Gospel of John, chapter nineteen. It tells us that the titleist, the charge above Jesus' head, was written in three languages, Hebrew, in Latin, and in Greek. And so the use of the titleist, again, is not something that is unusual. It is something that was uh, used uh, to state what the charge was against the crucified victim. Now, the figure that you see here uh, on the cross, this is to represent or to show you part of the, 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 the agony of crucifixion. Um, the first thing we want to notice is that one of the 
the difficult things about crucifixion is the difficulty to breathe. And so what happens is the person on the left is hunched over. You'll notice the legs go forward. And as a result, the rib cage, if you look at the rib cage, the rib cage caves in. So in order to breathe, the person has to push up on their feet, which would cause incredible pain, not just on their feet, but their, their wrists. Because in order to breathe and expand the rib cage, you have to push yourself up, as you see on the figure there on the right, in order to breathe. And so the inhalation, breathing in, and the exhalation, the breathing out, was absolute torture. And eventually what would happen is the person would become so weak after breathing in, breathing out, pushing themselves up, and then coming back down, pushing themselves up, coming back down. Eventually what would happen is the lungs would collapse and the heart, as we will see, the heart would rupture. And that is why most uh, deaths by crucifixion result in what we call asphyxiation. Asphyxiation. Basically, they can't breathe anymore. They asphyxiate because of the constant uh, movement uh, up and down, up and down, and and then due to weakness and, and pain, the victim can no longer breathe any longer. And so many of them would just suffocate to death or have a heart attack, what, what we call a cardiac arrest. Now, what would happen to a person that keeps hanging like this? Because of gravity, their limbs or their joints would go out of place, which would cause additional excruciating pain. Now, why is this important? Well, if you read Psalm 22, which is a Messianic Psalm, it says, they pierced my hands and my feet but then it says, all my bones are out of joint. All my bones are out of joint. And it talks about my heart melts like wax within me. That is an expression of agonizing pain. The heart feels like it's on fire. And that's because the heart is rapidly beating because it needs oxygen. If the lungs do not obtain enough oxygen, then the heart begins to beat rapidly because the heart needs oxygen to travel through the blood, to enter in through the, the chambers of the heart and so forth, the ventricles of the heart. And so what ends up happening is the bones come out of joint because of the gravity. So notice the Messianic Psalm 22 was being fulfilled on that first Good Friday. His bones were out of joint. It says they could count all my bones. It talks about his tongue cleaving to the roof of his mouth, which is exhaustion, and it is also dehydration. So the victim would be dehydrated, and their tongue, if you will, would, uh, would, would cleave to the roof of their mouth. Now, the other thing you also want to be aware of here is that the victim, of course, was not clothed. The victim would be exposed. And so the victim, I mean, it would not be unusual for the victim to, of course, if they have to urinate or uh, if, if, if there's a bowel movement, this would just add to the insult and the dehumanization of the victim of crucifixion. Now, this is going to explain for us why it is that something happens to Jesus right before he dies, because what ends up happening is, according to Matthew, Mark, and Luke, at least Matthew and Mark, it says that Jesus died with a, with a loud cry. He died letting out a, a loud cry, and then he expired. All right? There's a reason for that. We're going to get to that in a minute. The other thing you want to be aware of is the fact that when that the, the Greek word for hands also includes the forearm. So anything from the fingers up to the elbow that is the same Greek word. Uh, that means hand. And the nails were like the one you see on the left. They were tapered nails like spikes. Uh, it was about uh, one centimeter. The head was one centimeter, which, um, which is a, a small fraction in terms of inches. But 
It was about five to seven inches long. Now, I want you to notice the uh, cross view there. The nail would go, if you will, right here. Not here, because it would break through the hand. And remember, not one of his bones were broken, according to uh, the Psalms. And so we would have gone here in between the, uh, the, um, the bones here. And notice what it did was it, it, it went through what's called the median nerve. The median nerve. That is that uh, nerve there. I don't know if you can see my uh, cursor here. This here is the median nerve. And you can imagine the pain, the absolute pain uh, that would have come out of this as the nerve, the medial nerve, is being ruptured by this spike. This would cause fiery pain to run through his arms, the arms of the crucified victim. And because the medial nerve is being lacerated, the hand sometimes would experience paralysis. And so the hand of the victim would become paralyzed. And so you would have what looks like a claw. Your hand takes on this claw uh, appearance because the nerve has been severed. So remember, crucifixion was all about agonizing pain. Now you can see why Seneca was saying it's better to die, it's better to commit suicide than to be crucified. So this is a gruesome practice that Jesus endured for us. Now, when it comes to the feet, what would happen in the case of the feet was they would place the nail between the second and third toes. And what would happen here as well is this spike would also sever a number of the nerves in the feet, which again would cause incredible fiery pain to stream through the legs of the crucified victim. And in some cases, as I said, they would, they would place one foot upon the other and use one nail to uh, affix uh, the foot to the cross. And in some cases, they would place the feet on either end of the vertical beam of the cross and put nails through the heels. So again, um, the, the pain that is involved here is absolutely, absolutely excruciating by definition. So maximum pain, maximum penalty, that was the way that the Romans did things. Now, remember I was talking earlier about, um, about uh, some victims would be crucified with the nails put through their heels. Now, what you see in front of you here, the right one is an actual archaeological find. The one on the left is a, uh, it's basically a reconstruction. Um, what you see there on the right is the heel bone of a crucified victim that was discovered in 1969 in Jerusalem in an ossuary. An ossuary is a bone coffin where after Jews buried the dead and the bones were left, the, the, the flesh had rotted out, they would take the bones of the deceased and place them in a bone coffin. That's why it's called an ossuary for uh, bone in Latin. And so ossuaries were used until the end of the first century. So we know the date of this ossuary. And archaeologists discovered that inside this ossuary was the the skeletal remains of a Jewish man by the name of Yohanan, which is the Hebrew word for John. And what they discovered was that they even knew his occupation. He was a baker by trade. And he was buried in a family tomb. His ossuary was in a family tomb. Now, why is that important? Well, it's important because we're told that Jesus, being poor, of course, he did not have his own tomb, but his disciple Joseph of Arimathea had a family tomb and placed him in there. The other thing we learned from this archaeological discovery is that the you could still see the nail 
stuck inside the heel bone of this victim. Before 1969, many people doubted whether the Romans used nails or not in crucifixion. They thought that they just impaled people with, with ropes, <coughs> excuse me, and that they did not use nails. Well, after this discovery in 1969, uh, they backed off and, and acknowledged that indeed the Romans did use nails to crucify people. And the reason why they couldn't remove that nail was because if you look at the left reconstruction, the nail bent when they nailed it into the side of the uh, of the stipe or the vertical beam of the cross, it bent and they couldn't remove it. They also used a washer. You could see it on the left side. That wooden piece is a washer. It would have been used uh, with olive, uh, olive wood. Uh, you can see a little bit of it on the right, but it's very uh, deteriorated, decomposed. Um, but what this demonstrates to us is that, yes, nails were used in crucifixion and crucified victims, if they had families, their bodies would be given to the family members and uh, the, the remains, the, 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 the dead would be placed in their family tombs. Now, let's talk about the heart under crucifixion. Remember I told you that in the book of Psalms, in Psalm 22, it points out that uh, it says, my heart is, um, my heart is um, melting within me. On the left side, that's what a normal heart looks like. But I want you to notice that thin layer that you see around the heart, that thin layer is known as the pericardium. Pericardium is the membrane, that light membrane, that is around the heart. It's a thin membrane that covers the heart. Now, under intense stress and agony, the pericardium can fill with a clear fluid, sometimes called the serum. It can fill up with a clear fluid called pericardial effusion. So on the right side there, that is what the heart of a crucified victim would look like if you looked with an x-ray. That's what their heart would look like. That peri pericardial fluid is clear like water. It's a clear fluid. Now, remember what John tells us. In John 19, what does he tell us? He tells us that after Jesus died, one of the soldiers took a spear and thrust his side. And John said, blood and water came out. Now, for many, many centuries, that puzzled a lot of people. Where, What's this water? Where's this water coming from? You can understand blood being trapped in the heart. But where does this water come from? Well, now we know that what that water was, was the pericardial fluid that surrounded the heart after it had inflated. And there would have been fluid in the lungs because of asphyxiation. Uh, fluids uh, would have developed in the lungs. And so you can now understand how it is that when they thrust that spear into the side of Jesus, into his heart, you can now understand why water and blood came out. Water came out and blood. Obviously the blood from the heart. But notice what John saw was pericardial fluid. That looks like water. It's clear like water. So what this shows us is that when Jesus cried out with a loud voice and then he expired, that indicates to us that Jesus had what we would loosely call a heart attack, but that medical professionals would refer to as a, a cardiac arrest. Jesus experienced high, a, a cardiac arrest, which means his heart would have basically blown out like an engine blowing out it just stopped and so that would explain his cry that great cry that he let out as his heart basically collapsed on him so now we know where this idea of the water and blood comes from now in conclusion i i wanted to share with you um the shroud of turin i'm not making the claim that the shroud of turin is the Shroud of Jesus. There are some who are who are making that claim. Uh, Gary Habermas, for example, 
makes the claim that uh, this is the actual burial shroud of Jesus. Uh, I'm not sure yet. I, I've not made a judgment on this. Uh, I know my friend Michael Lacona is 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 somewhat moving in that direction, if he has not already uh, completely done so. But the reason why I mention this is because when we take a, a, a negative photo of the Shroud of Turin, what we see here is, is quite uncanny. So, for example, uh, if you could see my cursor, if you look at the head of the victim here, the, the victim has, and mind you, no one knows how this image got on here. They still don't have a clue how this image got onto this shroud. No clue. It's not paint. Uh, the blood is real human blood. And the spices on the shroud are indigenous to the land of Israel. So they don't know. But the reason why I'm bringing this up is because um, um, this is a topic that usually does come up when we deal with the crucifixion. But if you look at the victim's head, you will notice the victim has blood on the forehead and blood on the head as well and coming down the hair which would indicate that the, the head was pierced um we know jesus of nazareth we know that uh, he had his head pierced with a crown of thorns we also notice something else and that is the entry mark of the nails is on the wrist not on the hands it's on the wrist now, why is this intriguing? Well, it's intriguing because if this is a medieval fraud, then we need to ask the question, all medieval paintings of Jesus' crucifixion show him with the nails in the hands, in the palms of the hands. If this is a forgery, how did the artist know that Romans, in order to keep the body up, would have to put nails through the wrists? And notice the blood flow flows down the arms, like a natural blood flow. Notice that there's blood flow going down the arm here, the right arm and the left arm. The other thing you also want to bear in mind is that there seems to be laceration marks on the thigh of this victim. And also the victim is naked. This victim is not clothed. This victim is completely nude. And then if you look at the bottom here towards the feet, you'll notice there is blood effusion down here by the feet and by the legs, there are lacerations on the front of the legs. You can see the stripes here, All right? So that's the front end of the, the, the victim here of crucifixion. Um, this here is the back of the victim. It's the same shroud but this is from the back. I want you to notice, if you look up to the top, the uh, effusion of blood on the head. Remember in the front here, there was blood here. You see it coming down the head here. On the back, there's an effusion of blood here on the head. Um, again, why would there be blood there? Well, if the scalp was pierced uh, and the forehead was pierced, uh, this would explain why there'd be blood on the head but notice something very interesting notice that the back of the victim is heavily lacerated with whip marks notice the buttocks here the the, the victim is nude here there are laceration marks across the buttocks there are laceration marks across the back and notice there are laceration marks on the back of the legs I just want us to look at something here before we look at that again. Remember the victim is lacerated, whipped along the back, down into the region of the buttocks, down on the legs, and down into the calf muscles as well. And then we, we come back to the shroud here. That's what we see, lacerations along the legs, up towards the thighs, the buttocks, the back. And notice down here, by the soles of the feet, you notice there's blood effusion by the foot of the victim. And so am I saying that the shroud, this shroud is the shroud of Jesus of Nazareth? No, I'm not saying it is. But what I'm saying is whoever did this uh, did a pretty, pretty interesting job of presenting something that is not 
usual. That is, is not in sync with what we find in medieval art or Christian iconography. What is also interesting about this is that no one has been able to explain how this image got on the shroud. No one. The closest someone said that the only the only thing that would have been able to leave a negative imprint like this on this fabric would have had to be something with intense radi radioactive heat. That is, it would be like radiation going through this fabric. Now, we're told in the Gospels that when Jesus was placed in a shroud, we're told that in John 20, when they went to the tomb, they said that they saw the grave cloths and they looked like it, it was caved in. Like think of a, a chrysalis when a, a caterpillar uh, forms a chrysalis where they cover themselves in this web-like uh, cocoon and then it goes dry and it caves in. Well, the grave cloths of Jesus were not disturbed. It wasn't like he got up and started moving it out, you know, unstripping himself and so forth. They were just lying there with the, the headpiece to the side. So the word that is used in the Greek of John 20 is a word that means something that is caved in, which means I would say that in the resurrection, Jesus' body would have gone through the shroud. It would have gone through the, the, the grave cloths because he didn't have to get up and just unwind himself. The resurrection was a supernatural event. Is it this? Is this? Is this what happened? If, if Christ rose from the dead and his body penetrated through the fabric in, radi in resurrection power, is that what left the imprint? We don't know. We don't know. Uh, so if you are interested in that, you would probably uh, want to get your hands on Dr. Gary Habermas's work. He has written on this subject. Okay, then. So um, I think that uh, I think we are done here. That was some great information. Thank you so much. Oh, my pleasure. Honestly, as I sat there listening, I'm overwhelmed of his sacrifice. And I'm very thankful that he loves us enough to die for us. Amen. Um, Amen. Die for me. I wish all churches took the time and went um, into great detail like you just presented. So thank you very much.